Welcome everybody that's joining us here today. Welcome everybody. So I'm just keeping an eye on my um, waiting room over here. And um, so welcome to everybody who's uh, joining us for our webinar uh, today. Um, my name is Paula Carroll. We're recording this session here. So I'm just going to share my screen for a second and um, share a couple of slides uh, with you. And in parallel, I am um, admitting people uh, into the, the session. So I'm going to leave my slides like this and just do my quick introduction before I hand over to our young women uh, to speak uh, today. So my name is Paula Carroll. We're recording this session. We'll post it on our um, YouTube uh, channel uh, later on. Each of our participants, we will keep you muted until um, the uh, discussion se session at the end. Um, our uh, speakers are going to talk to us today on uh, stochastic uh, optimization and game theory. Uh, we are the wisdom group, and we just want to highlight here what our objectives are. So this is what the Wisdom Forum uh, aims to do. So to advise and make recommendations about best practices in relation to uh, gender equality and the issues that women in OR face. Uh, we aim to promote championing, uh, networking and mentoring, and um, particularly of young women at the early stages of their career in OR. And we also want to promote a conversation around how OR can be utilized to create a, a diverse and inclusive future. Uh, the Euro executive have an EDI, an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion uh, policy, and we invite you to look at that on the, uh, their website. So one of the mechanisms we use to um, achieve our objectives is the Young Women for, or, for OR initiative. And you can see here the picture of our 2022 uh, 12 young women. And the ones in the boxes, there are our speakers for today, and they're highlighted over here. Laura and uh, Miriam and Nina, not in that order. Uh, so we will um, invite them to speak just in a second. And our um, expert today is Manuel Bombs, who many of you will know, and he's former Euro president. Later on, he might tell us a little bit about this uh, award that he uh, created um, in his role as editor in chief at the European the Euro uh, Journal of Computational um, Optimization. So more about that later. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to invite our first speaker, uh, Miriam, uh, to um, share her screen. And we will give her uh, 10 minutes for her presentation. OK, we can see that, Miriam. Whenever you're ready, off you go. Can you hear us, Miriam? You can unmute yourself. We can see your slides. Yes, so apparently my unmute button disappeared when I started sharing. <laughs> Good luck. Okay, we're looking forward to hearing your talk. Off you go. Okay, so today I'll be presenting some work where I talk about the value of supplier flexibility in uh, high tech industries. So, I think my computer is not liking it anymore. Will it not go forward? No, it won't do anything anymore. Can you stop sharing and maybe I can show your slides for you? Can you see the next slide? Now? Yes, yeah, we can see it okay. now. Yeah, good. That would work. Okay, so... Um, yeah, we'll be talking about high-tech supply chains. So first of all, I wanted to give you a bit of an impression about what high-tech supply chains actually mean. So what we have in mind in this research is these 
uh, chip manufacturing machines or, for example, uh, medical equipment for operating rooms, but also production of aircraft. So really these big systems where a lot of components need to be put together to assemble uh, one uh, quite expensive uh, end product. So this is the setting that we're looking at. And the problem is that for these very specialized uh, uh, items, these original equipment manufacturers or the OEMs typically outsource uh, tasks for uh, component development and production to suppliers. But since these systems are already so specialized, there are often only a limited number of suppliers who can actually produce these components. And due to this uh, close involvement also in the development process, often there's also only a single supplier that they work with at, uh, for a specific product. And the risk here is for the OEM, of course, that this supplier doesn't have enough capacity, which would result in delay of, for example, delivering your aircraft to your customers. So the delays for this uh, OEM are very costly. And I think we've all also seen maybe some news items about this recently with the worker shortages going on in many industries, which also affects the producers of uh, aircraft parts and in turn also uh, uh, affects Boeing or Airbus, the big uh, aircraft manufacturers, because they cannot get their uh, components. And I think everybody has also uh, heard about the shortage of computer chips, which has even stopped complete uh, manufacturing lines for uh, cars. But this is not only a recent problem, because also uh, on the right of the slide, I have the case of about, uh, I think, 10 to 15 years ago already, where the introduction of the Boeing 787, the Dreamliner, was actually uh, being delayed because the producer of some uh, small titanium bolts was not able to produce um, the required components. So even uh, such small components, if they're not available, they have very large consequences for these manufacturers because they cannot uh, deliver their end products. So this really seems to uh, have good incentives for these uh, manufacturers of uh, or the suppliers of components to make sure that they invest in sufficient capacity so the manufacturer can in turn also produce uh, the products that they make and deliver to their uh, customers. So what we found out by discussing uh, with some of these high-tech manufacturers and suppliers that were involved uh, in our overall research project was that um, for these suppliers, the long-term view is actually the most important reason to invest. Because for many of these products, I show here uh, some of these uh, chip manufacturing machines, but also for aircraft, there are often newer and updated uh, versions of the product that are introduced. And if I'm supplying for uh, one of these uh, product generations, I'm also aware that most likely there will be a next product generation again in the future. And if I uh, perform well, if I can supply what the manufacturer wants, um, then maybe I'll have the opportunity to work again together in the future. But if I'm not performing well now, if I'm not delivering, then as a supplier, I know that there's a very high risk that the manufacturer may start to search for uh, another supplier in the future. So the aim of our research is actually to analyze this effect. What can, how can this longer term view help to uh, improve coordination in the supply chain? And in particular, we're looking also at how uh, does supplier flexibility impact this? And with supplier flexibility, we refer to the number of suppliers that the OEM has available to work with. So for this, we actually use a quite simple wholesale price contract. But I think as many people know, the problem with standard wholesale price contracts is that they cannot coordinate the supply chain unless you as a buyer, or in this case, the manufacturer, shift all your profit to the uh, to your supplier, which is in reality not going to happen. So we change this whole surprise contract slightly by looking at what we call a performance dependent renewal. So we have a, a we model this uh, problem as an infinite horizon stochastic game. So in every stage of the game, there's one supplier that can make a decision. So the supplier decides on how much capacity to build. And based on the performance of the supplier, the OEM will then choose who to work with for the next generation. 
So we have a probability that we denote by R that's dependent on the capacity uh, that the supplier built. And with this probability, uh, the manufacturer continues working with the supplier for the next generation. And of course, the more I invest in capacity now, the more likely I am to keep the manufacturer happy. So the more likely I am to continue working together. And this figure sort of illustrates how these uh, probabilities of switching to the different supplier work. So using this information, uh, we can uh, formulate uh, the uh, profit functions, which we can use to uh, determine the optimal capacity decisions for the supplier. So we're looking at stationary strategies here now, and I won't show the exact uh, formulation of the optimal capacity because we don't have time to go into those details. But the most important thing is that, of course, it's dependent on the wholesale price, but it also depends on what capacity the alternative supplier would choose if they were the ones to decide. Because if the alternative supplier is very much willing to invest in capacity, then it's very likely that if the manufacturer once starts working with that supplier, they will continue to work together for a long time. So in that case, it's more in my interest as the first supplier to avoid that this happens. So now that we have these, uh, an expression for the capacity for each supplier when they are the one working with the manufacturer, we questioned whether uh, we could find an equilibrium solution where neither of these uh, suppliers would actually uh, have incentives to deviate. And we found out that actually for every wholesale price, you can find uh, such an equilibrium for every wholesale price for which the suppliers are actually willing to participate. So knowing this, we started to wonder whether we we could actually uh, identify a wholesale price uh, for which we could find a coordinating equilibrium. So where uh, both uh, suppliers, if they are the one that you're working with, will make the capacity decision that's actually optimal for the overall supply chain. And we found out that this uh, wholesale price actually uh, consists, uh, exists. Again, I won't uh, show the exact expression, but the most important thing here is that for this wholesale price, uh, this wholesale price is actually lower than the value of the end product for which the manufacturer can sell their product, which is uh, different from the standard wholesale price contracts where I said you can only uh, find, uh, only get a coordinated uh, solution when you transfer all profits to the supplier. So when your wholesale price is equal to R, but here we can actually find this equilibrium that's uh, coordinated while both the manufacturer and the supplier are expected to earn uh, a positive profit. So uh, we found that that's a very interesting uh, result. But all of this was for uh, two suppliers. And as I said, we're also interested in looking at what is the value of the supplier flexibility. So uh, we looked at what happens when we have multiple suppliers. So I'll explain this with just this uh, single picture. On the horizontal axis, we have uh, the number of suppliers. And on the uh, vertical axis, we have the wholesale price that's required to achieve uh, the coordinated equilibrium. And the R, again, indicates the uh, price of the end products and the delta indicates how much we uh, value the future. We see, of course, again, that for uh, N is one, W needs to be equal to R, but we see when uh, there are two suppliers, there's a very big drop in the wholesale price that's required uh, for coordination. So this is really this effect of changing, uh, threatening to change to another supplier. And we see that this uh, effect continues a bit when we add more suppliers, but it's rather small. So this is actually good news for high-tech industries where, as I said, usually there's only a very small number of suppliers. In fact, it's often the case that there's uh, only one main supplier and the second supplier uh, can produce, but at a higher cost. So we questioned ourselves, is it still beneficial in this uh, asymmetric case to uh, use the second supplier? And it turns out that in many cases this is. It's actually that extreme that sometimes it's even uh, profitable or good to use this second supplier, even if 
working with a supplier means that OEM is losing money because the benefit of not working with one monopolistic supplier is uh, that big. So um, that was a very brief over my overview of the research project. So I'll summarize a few key points. Um, yeah, I think our research showed that switching to an alternative supplier indeed works very well as an incentive to build capacity. And we show that there exists this coordinated equilibrium where both parties uh, earn an expected uh, positive profit. So um, that's a big benefit compared to standard wholesale price contracts. And what is good for the uh, high tech industry is that we showed that more suppliers, of course, are helpful. But uh, this one alternative supplier uh, is actually uh, the biggest benefit. And what I uh, briefly showed on the last slide uh, is that even in case of this asymmetric cost, it remains beneficial for the manufacturer to have this alternative supplier. So um, to keep also your main supplier motivated. Um, yeah, that concludes my presentation. I know it was a very brief overview of the research, but I hope it uh, gave you some insights into uh, the main project. And of course, if you're uh, having any questions, we'll, uh, we can always talk more later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miriam. So there's probably a whole lot of um, emotion, uh, um, what do they call them, emojis coming up, uh, applauding you for your, your work. So well done on getting over those technical issues as well. That's always a little bit nerve wracking at the beginning <laughs> <laughs> when things go haywire. So, so well done on keeping it on track. And it was a lovely presentation. And as you say, very brief. So we won't take questions now. We're going to pass over to Nina and we'll have questions for our young women and some commentary later on. So um, Nina, would you like to share screen? And you have 10 minutes to um, give us an overview of your work, please. OK, is my screen visible yep. already? Oh, we can great. see it there. Lovely. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, so I will be presenting work on uh, anticipatory decision making for a stochastic dynamic vehicle routing problem. Um, in particular, we're looking at a dynamic vehicle routing problem with stochastic customer requests. So we're assuming we have a service area that's given, we have a depot that's given, and we have um, a fleet of these uh, vehicles. And in each vehicle, there's a driver that actually has a specified working day. So we have to make sure that the vehicles return to the depot by a given um, time at the end of the day. Um, and then these vehicle drivers serve customer requests, and there are two types of customer requests. Uh, the first set of customer requests is known before the vehicle drivers actually start their routes. So, for example, the uh, black circles over here could be initial customers, and we actually have to serve them. So in the initial routing, um, we have to make sure that all of the initial customers are covered. And then the other set of customers is the stochastic customers. Uh, for example, the white one in the bottom of the figure. And these occur while the vehicles are already serving other customer requests. And then as a decision maker, we have to make a decision about if we want to accept the customer request or not. Accepting the customer request brings us a reward uh, associated with the customer, but it also takes up some of the resources of our drivers that we could also spend later. So in these bars, we see the black portion is the resources that are already spent basically by the uh, planned tour and the white amount of the bar is um, the remaining resource which we also call slack for each um, vehicle driver. So we do um, want to look at the resources of our drivers that we have but on the other hand our objective is to maximize some of the rewards that we can accumulate over one of these working days. Um, so basically this entire problem has two main parts. The first one is the initial routing that already sets up how the resources are used in the beginning of the day. And then the second part is to decide about new customer requests. And these two parts are related and we will talk about uh, why that is and how that is. So for the first part, the initial routing, what one could do is to come up with a classical savings approach, uh, for example, like this. But the problem is that if we don't have a capacity and in these um, applications, we typically don't consider a capacity and the time capacity is not very relevant because we have a rather small proportion of initial customers, then we could end up in a situation like this where we have one route, although we have three vehicles. So that means that two of the vehicles will remain in the depot idling while one 
vehicle is serving customers. So we thought about modifying this and we came up with the idea, okay, we can change it and have a savings approach with a threshold where we can only do these merging operations if the resulting tour contains not more than a certain amount of customers. So basically these two um, figures that we see are already two uh, extremes of that idea. So we could have um, a threshold that is the number of customers that we have, then basically it's an unlimited savings approach. Or we could say we divide the number of customers by the number of vehicles, and then we have a rather balanced initial routing in terms of the number of customers per vehicle. And to evaluate the impact um, of this idea, we came up with a formula to determine the threshold uh, using a threshold parameter M, and we can switch that between zero uh, for a classical savings approach or one for a balanced savings approach and anything in between pretty much. And then when we have the uh, initial routing uh, set up, then we go into the dynamic process where the vehicles are on the road. Um, and every time a new customer request occurs, we have to make a decision. Uh, and in that situation, we can describe the situation by means of a state where we know the time, all the routes that we have, and uh, all the information about the new uh, customer request. And in this situation, for example, we could decide to reject the customer and leave the routes as they are. So that would bring us to a so-called post-decision state that looks like this. Um, this decision would bring us a reward of zero because we don't accept the new customer. Or we could, for example, decide to include the customer in the first tour, which is the one in the upper left part of the figure. Um, and so we end up with a post-decision state where we modified the routing uh, and we did uh, accumulate the, um, we did get the reward of the customer. And then after that post-decision state, we actually go on, all the vehicles follow their routes, and at some point we will get a new customer request. So we would love to find the policy that assigns for each state uh, the best decision to choose, uh, but that's typically not possible for um, problems of this size. So what we're doing instead of finding the optimal policy is to um, approximate um, a good policy, and we're doing that um, by using value function approximation, which is um, taking the same idea of the balance equation to say we want to maximize in each decision point the sum of the immediate rewards by the decision and the value of the post-decision state, which is the expected future rewards after the post-decision state. And this last part is a challenging one, and we're going to estimate this value of the post-decision state by using offline simulation. Um, unfortunately, the problem is still kind of complex, so we're doing two other things as well. So the first one is routing heuristic, where we say we don't consider all technical options to um, that we feasibly have, but we only incorporate those options where for each tour we consider the cheapest insertion position. Uh, and then we consider that we could reject the customer, and then we don't modify the routing at all. Um, and then the other thing is that I mentioned that we want to estimate the value of these post-decision states. And unfortunately, the description of this post-decision states contains routes, which is challenging to depict. So we came up with three different feature combinations trying to reduce or aggregate this information into um, features. Um, all of these feature combinations that we're proposing contain the information about the current time that we are in, because it contains information about how much demand we still expect to happen in the future. Um, and then we also want to depict the resources that we still have open that we can still plan. And uh, I mentioned the Slack, this remaining available resources that we have. So we could depict the Slack for each vehicle individually. We could calculate the mean. Or we could say, well, maybe the routes are a bit imbalanced. Maybe we want to calculate the mean uh, slack over the fleet and the standard deviation. So these three feature combinations are what we're going to look at. Uh, and in the computational study, we're doing that by uh, considering instances where we have three vehicles, a time horizon of eight hours, 15 minutes of service time, and different degrees of dynamism. And as a benchmark, we're using a myopic approach where we accept customers if we can and insert them in the cheapest position over the entire fleet, and we apply a classical savings approach. So um, for the initial routing, what's the impact of that? 
Um, here we see results for a degree of dynamism of 75%, but it's the same picture basically for the other degrees of dynamism as well. And what we see is that for the different feature combinations, um, and then in there for the different um, initial routing factors M, we see the improvement in percent against the benchmark. Uh, remember that the initial routing factor of zero was a classical savings approach, and of one, it was a more like a balanced uh, initial routing. And what we can conclude is that um, an initial routing, although it might seem less efficient in the beginning, um, is actually better in terms of the overall um, problem that we're looking at. And the other thing is when we're looking at the feature choice, so here, this is now for a degree of dynamism of 50%, and then for each of the in, um, initial routing factors, 0, 0 0.5 and 1, we see the um, result for the, in, for the different feature uh, combinations. And here we see that if we have um, a rather imbalanced initial routing, um, and also if we have a balanced routing for a degree of dynamism of 50%, we always come up with the best solution quality of um, only considering only the mean slack over the entire fleet. So apparently, um, if we have um, a small degree of dynamism, so a relatively high number of initial customers, uh, then considering this uh, entire information over the entire fleet is sufficient. But if we have a higher degree of dynamism, meaning that we have fewer initial customers, um, we have more flexibility there to spread these customers. And here we see that if we have an imbalance initial routing, uh, then it is actually worthwhile to consider that additional information that we have an imbalance in the initial routing to also in, in, include that into our feature selection. So here for smaller initial routings uh, factors, we want to include that information. For balanced initial routing, that's not necessary because the routes are balanced anyway. So to conclude, um, we can show that the initial routing and the feature selection impact the solution quality for this uh, problem setting. Um, and while for the initial routing, it's always better to have a balanced initial routing, the best feature selection actually depends on the initial routing and problem features or instance features like the degree of dynamism. And in the future, we're also looking to uh, look at other interesting stochastic elements in demand environment or resources. Um, and I'm very excited to discuss my work with you now or in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Nina. So uh, again, a lovely little round of applause. That was very nice, very nicely condensed. I haven't had to call anybody for their 10 minute time warning yet. So uh, well done, really interesting. We're not gonna take questions for Nina just now. We're going to move on to Laura's uh, presentation. So Laura, if you're ready, can you share screen? It's popping up there now. Yes, so I can see that. So whenever you're ready, off you go. Yes, now I think you can hear me, right? Yes, we can hear you. Yep, off you go. Okay. Thank you, Paula, for the introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the proposal of a new influence measure to evaluate the importance that certain features have on a classification problem. And this is a co-authored work together with Professor Ignacio Garcia Jurado and Valvina Casas Mendez. So first of all, a classification problem consists of predicting the value of a qualitative response variable for one or more individuals, making use of the values we know of certain categorical variables of such individuals. And these categorical variables are called features or attributes. These predictions are, no, are, are based sorry, on the knowledge obtained through a training sample of individuals for which we know the values of the features and of the response. So what is the methodology we are going to use? It is a combination between machine learning and game theory. Classification problems can be addressed by using machine learning techniques, and in our case are characterized by a tuple x, y, m, where x is a vector of features, being k the set of indices of such features, each feature takes values in a finite set, y is a response variable which also takes values in a finite set, and m is the training sample, where each x super i and y super i are the observed values of the features and of the response variable corresponding to the individual i. 
Now, a classifier trained with a sample M is a map that assigns to every observation of X a probability distribution over B. Here, each FB super M of A is the estimated probability that an individual whose observed values of the features are given by A belongs to group B of the response variable. And many of these classifiers, in addition to classify, allow us to evaluate the importance that the various features had in the classification of a particular individual. However, these evaluations will depend on the classifier can. In the works I present here of Strambel, Hankononenko, and Data and co authors, the authors introduce procedures to assess such importance that can be applied regardless of the classifier chosen. These are called model agnostic methods. And these both procedures are based on game theoretical solutions. In the case of Strambel, Hankononenko, they study what happens at an individual level and data at all. Uh, generalize this to a sample, but base their method theoretically on the binary scenario. So what we propose is to generalize these procedures and we introduce a global model agnostic influence measure based on the Shapley value of cooperative games. In the general context of game theory, the Shapley value is used to distribute the games of a cooperation among the agents involved. And in this particular case, we will use the Shapley value to distribute the importance of the classification among the features. So now I am going to explain a step by step how we constructed our influence measure. Our starting point is a training sample. So first we need to train our classifier with this sample, thus obtaining our trained classifier. Then, given a subset of features and their values, we set the subsample that consists of the individuals with those characteristics. And the next step is to define the cooperative game. First, we fix a response, B, and then for each individual of our subsample and each possible subset of features, we compute what we call the difference predictions game. Basically, we are Calculating here the difference between the average prediction of our classifier when only feature values corresponding to, to S are known and the average prediction of our classifier when no feature value is known. Then we have to compute the Shapley value of the restricted game and know that we restrict the game to a subset T which contains all the features we intend to study. And then we have to average these Shapley's values, obtaining our influence measure. This would be the coordinate L of our influence measure, which is the importance that future L have had in that these individuals had been classified as B when we only take into account those features in T. And this individual influence is the corresponding part to future L of this total influence. So the evolution of these two quantities, the individual influence and the total influence, is very illustrative of the real influence that these features have had in, a, in the classification. For instance, let us suppose that the set R consists of a single element, that is that we fix the value of only one future, and we compute the influence measure for all the individuals with that characteristic. If in that case, this individual influence is very close to this total influence, and at the same time, this total influence is very positive or very negative, then we can conclude that individuals with feature L equal to AL have a high or low probability of being classified as B. And this is mainly due to feature L. In the examples that we will see next, what I will be interested in will be to detect what we call influence scenarios that are situations in which this total influence is very large in absolute value to be able to detect which features are responsible for this total influence to be, to be that large. So uh, what we did was to apply our influence measure or methodology to a COVID database. We had a data set of more than 10,000 patients infected by COVID in Galicia in the first wave of the pandemic. And our objective was to study the influence that certain features of such patients had in these three binary response variables 
related to the disease progression, which are the need of hospitalization, the need for intensive care unit admission, and the eventual disease. And the features that we considered were the age, discretized into four groups, the sex, and some previous pathologies that are grouped by levels of severity. So in this slide, I present uh, the evolution of the individual influence and the total influence of the um, according to the age levels when we consider the classification problem of the disease. So what did, what we did here first was to select all those individuals all those individuals who died, and then we consider the subsamples by age levels. So in this case, we can see that there are two influence scenarios, two situations at which the uh, total influence is very large. One in the case that the group of age is zero and another one in the case that the group of age is three. Here, we observe that the individual influence of age is very negative. And this means that having group of age zero plays against the disease. And in this case, we observe that the individual influence is very positive. So having a group of, of age three plays in favor of the disease. And the fact that these individuals did not die or did die was mainly due to feature age, which we can deduce by the proximity of these values. In this slide, I present the same situation, but now for the classification problem of the intensive care unit admission, uh, here, an influence scenario for those individuals with a group of age two stands out, and we also observed a big drop of the individual influence and total influence between uh, groups age two and three. And this could be due to the fact that, at least in Galicia, in the first wave of the pandemic, many elderly people passed away prior to their admission to the intensive care unit. In all the tests we did, we detected that the feature age was uh, the most influential feature, much more than the rest of the features. So as I mentioned, we restrict our game to those features in T, and our influence measure will allow us to remove this feature age from the set T and perform the study with the remaining features. If we do this, we observed what happens here with the individual influence and total influence of the respiratory pathologies when we consider the classification problem of the hospitalization. And we see that in this case, there is an influence scenario for those people who have uh, severe respiratory pathologies. The fact, of the fact of having these respiratory pathologies plays in favor of the hospitalization, and the fact that these individuals were hospitalized was mainly due to these severe respiratory pathologies. And just to finish, I would like to mention that the work I have just presented here has been published in the Azure uh, Journal, and you have here the main reference in which we also axiomatically characterized our influence measure by means of some game theoretical properties. And that's all from my part. Thank you for listening to me. And I am open to answering any questions or either at the open discussion or by email. Thank you very much, Laura. That was lovely. Um, so you can stop sharing now. Very nice. And again, I didn't have to remind anybody to, to complete on their 10 minutes. Um, our subject matter expert today is um, somebody who many of you will know very well. Uh, so I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Manuel, and you have 10 minutes or so if you want to um, provide some commentary or some feedback um, to the young uh, women. And then after that, uh, we'll throw open to the floor for, for general um, comments and questions. Is that okay? Thank you very much, Paula. Thank you to our three speakers. Miriam, Nini, and, and Laura. Laura. Laura, and we we'll just ask our speakers to turn back on their uh, cameras. I'm going to turn mine off and leave you with the three speakers. Um, it was very interesting for me to see how decision support 
and the uncertainty can be uh, developed to address very different different problems and uh, uh, you will excuse me that I mostly ask questions and rather provide uh, suggestions or answers because I think it's important to clarify this different role of of uncertainty in your work. So, and let me again start with this, with this, uh, with the program in, in line in alignment of the program. So, I would start with uh, the paper of Miriam Meia, in, in uh, who, who uh, addressing who is addressing supply chain problem. I think the most the important uh, source of uncertainty here is the demand. Is this correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so, uh, and by demand, you mean the demand the OEM face on the market. It's yes, not so in their demand on finally producing the final product. Is this correct? Yes, it's indeed a demand that they face from the market. So they are driven by the market, basically. Yes. Okay. Uh, and this brings me to the next question because you, we are talking about supply chains and it was not completely clear whether you addressed the problem that the specialist supplier is also dependent on some other suppliers and how it would change the, the, the model. It seems that the, the, this is a, a, a three per, even two person game. Yes. Infinite horizon, of course. So this is very important and very, very interesting, of course. But uh, there are less restrictions to the supplier, as 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 I was uh, uh, expecting. Yes, indeed. For this uh, paper, we're looking at uh, only the interaction between this supplier and uh, the OEM, the manufacturer. So indeed, we didn't put a lot of uh, restrictions on um, where the supplier actually gets their input from or uh, everything related to that. We really focused on the interaction between these uh, two parties or more if you consider that there may be multiple uh, suppliers that could be involved. But we're, uh, our main aim was really to find out what is the uh, influence of having this renewal type of contract where we really look at multiple periods, uh, how that affects capacity decisions. And of course, indeed, uh, there is more going on yes. behind that. As you, as, you, as, you, uh, as you clearly pointed out, it's sort of a discussion also of an oligopolistic situation, right? Yeah. So you have one or two or, or three competing suppliers. One of them is an incumbent and the others want to enter the market and so on. Well, it's a sad, sad historical fact that uh, planned economies did not do well at all in 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 coping with uncertainty in general, and and it's understandable that we address our hopes to the market mechanism. But actually, I'm not convinced that the market would solve this, particularly the coordination problems for us, even in this in this situation. And the more in the situation where you actually, you mentioned as a case, these titanium bolts, right? For the for the uh, finalization of the Dreamliner. And I have no idea, I'm not an expert at all, but I think that titanium is one of the scarce raw materials, which for sure these suppliers did not produce them or mine themselves. So actually this addresses a different, again, a problem, of diversity or inclusion is is that we are facing with this type of models like global north not facing but concentrating focusing so we actually assume that the primary materials often produced by the global south and by companies who who have no real choices uh, or they don't face the same choices as they should. <laughs> Let me put it like this. So it, it would be also interesting to see how that, how uh, an extension of your model, or probably you had done it already, 
to long supply chains or also to I should say not uh, departure from oligopolistic and uh, ideas and bet and 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 try to get some decentralized mechanism maybe maybe by a centralized decision maker because your important point was it is decentralized decision right it's not a not not a decision maker or a, a regulatory instance which is no, coordinated uh, decentralized yes so yeah, I these are challenges for the future. It's not a criticism of, of, of the papers, just just the association that came to my mind. Yes, I think I agree that there are like plenty of opportunities to extend this further. And uh, yeah, it would indeed be interesting to look at a longer supply chain, like what happens in the other stages. We uh, also have, uh, have been working and are still working on other projects where we're also looking at... Um, this is only, we're looking at the supplier of a single component, of course, to finish sure. one of these end products, you need a lot more. So there are a lot of ways uh, to extend this work further and to look at uh, other related problems. So we're currently working on some of them, but uh, I agree that indeed there's a lot more uh, interesting things to look at that uh, could be also very uh, yeah, beneficial for more realist, realistic settings indeed. Thank you. Um, I, so on, on my mind, I don't want to monopolize the discussion, the general discussion too long. If, if Paula agrees, I would rather uh, then pass on to discussing the next contribution. If this we is will. Thank you, Manuel, because we will be a little bit tight on time. But I think that's a really interesting avenue, <laughs> another whole uh, direction to, to consider as well. But yes, we'll move on to the other two uh, speakers, if you don't mind. And then we'll come to uh, the attendees. So I know we've got lots of other experts yes, in the we have audience a, today a, as well. A big audience. So this was uh, yeah. um, of, of specialists. So I'm, I'm more the generalist view. And you will excuse me for that. that Lovely insights. I cannot go yeah. evaluate very well all the details. So we are we are now moving to stochastic dynamic vehicle routing, and the, here the source of uncertainty was basically a decision of a customer to, to place a re her, her request or not, right? Yeah. So basically, the customer uh, requests are what's yeah, the, uncertain the, for the for the service provider. The, the the service company would not know in advance basically yes. who, who is no not who so so how many and, and the location of the customers yes so basically also we're not working on a network so they can theoretically if they're anywhere in the service area so anywhere. that makes it also a bit more challenging um, and we don't know how many there will be so we expect a certain number of customers but it follows a Poisson process so it could be it's I think awesome. your, your presentation was very clear. I liked it very much, and I know how much work you, uh, you must have invested to to visualize all these complex processes behind it. Um, but one one thing needs still clarification, and this is the degree of dynamism is not an individual feature of a certain customer, right? It's again a holistic description of the situation. All if, customers are homogeneous. Is yes. This correct. Well, so all customers are pretty much the same, and yes. uh, the degree in, of dynamism in. refers rather to um, the instances in general. So we tested it for different sets of instances to see if we have a service provider that faces a really high degree of dynamism. Does that change anything hmm. in comparison to a service provider that may um, not have so many? stochastic customer requests and more known customer requests because depending on the application it might really make a difference yes and this brings me again to this to this uh discrimination among customers basically you could as you said you you did it in an extreme way you had deterministic customers and and stochastic customers somehow but how about uh and this is i think a very realistic assumption but just an approximation so there could be regular customers. So basically, I'm now in the long, uh, in the dynamic context, dynamic stochastic or dynamic uncertain context. So regular customers, returning customers, and occasional ones. 
But the occasional ones, I agree, the best thing is to do is, is assume some stochastic, uh, make some stochastic assumption. I don't think we, you can, we can improve upon that. The regular customers, however, they have, of course, the advantage being known to the service provider. So they have some ideas. They could estimate the distribution better. On the other hand, they could also request a certain guaranteed service leverage. So when I put 10 requests in 10 time intervals, I am expecting that eight of them are serviced. If not, goodbye. So did you think of, of extending this? So this would be sort of stochastic and robust versions, a sort of robust uh, framework. I know that's very challenging and also from the computational point of view, it doesn't make life easier. But I'm not even sure about this when it comes to heuristics, because you can use different, like like the deterministic customers, right? You can, in the simulations, you could do sort of simplification even to computationally. I think it's a very interesting idea to go in that direction in the future. Um, we did think about what if we cannot reject customers? So that would be like, going in that direction yes. um but like having a certain service level that would be definitely really interesting what well, and also like if we look at it in a, in a longer perspective if we then consider if we cannot keep that service level what if the customers then disappear and are really gone and they just don't show up even if they have a high value maybe to us that would be definitely interesting to look at in the future yeah Thank but you. we haven't done it so far. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I always, it's, it's always sound that I'm demanding, but actually I'm I'm excited that I want to, to understand yeah, me and too. Then <laughs> the questions pop up quite That's, naturally for me. It's a, it's a really nice idea. I will definitely keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. You've spent, set the expectations so high now, uh, opening up these new avenues, Manuel. So I'm delighted to hear now what you're going to suggest to Laura. <laughs> yeah, but I have I've missed the EDI aims in 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 in, 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 in your stock i'm sorry for that but i actually i, I want to place an, a comment and i know that at least one is here we don't face too much gender imbalance in in or in in austria fortunately currently what we do like is of course diversity in regional background but this is a general european problem i would say but happily we you can see, I think I can immediately list four or five full professors in OR who are very active and very, one of them was here uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in particular in the, in the, in the area, Ninja also is doing the, the, her research. So this is good. It's great to have, have those role models. That's brilliant. Okay. Sorry, Laura, it took me some time to come to your paper. I found it very interesting. You also were so kind to provide me ahead of the relevant publications uh, in, in Azure, as you, uh, you mentioned before. So um, very interesting uh, topic. And of course, in classification, the role of uncertainty is more or less clear. Machine learning. So we have new incoming data. We don't know the labor or the, the, yeah, the labor, and therefore we have to predict it. And uh, there is a well-developed theory. And I, I, I think you made it also very clear that even in case of finitely many choices, um, the labor is usually finite, but even for the predictors, if the predictors uh, are, are, are taking values only in finitely many, uh, only taking finite, finite value many values then the problem remains very challenging and i like the idea very much that we you share this approach of attributing probability to uh, belonging to one class with many many other machine learning models very rare of them just just predict a class as a zero one at a zero one outcome so many of these provide weights or probability or, or likelihoods to belong to one class. So you join them, but with a very distinctive uh, approach coming from co uh, cooperative game theory. Uh, first of all, 
My question, is there any other uncertainty in this context of your study of COVID-19 patients? Uh, or is it this classical framework? Of no, the, the, the only uncertainty is regarding, regarding the, the classifier, the classification, yes. yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a bit of... Uh, wondering have been wondering about the com uh, computational complexity for developing this this uh, classifier because as we know calculating shapley value in itself is quite demanding suffering from from combinatorial complexity and you have to repeat it quite frequently in your application so Again, my respects that you could conduct this study on, 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 on this many individuals and also relatively many predictors. You explained very well the methods to reduce complexity, and I like it very much that by this influence measure you can do this and, and, and mask basically the dominant influence. I think this is it. Did I correctly understand? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, well, actually, here what we did was to um, to implement the influence measure, and we exactly compute the Shapley value. So it took a while to obtain the results, and a future a future idea that we have to continue in this line of research is to. Uh, conduct an study, but now approximating the Shapley value. Uh, because we could do this with the exact Shapley value because we uh, didn't consider too many features or too many future values. So it was possible to do it. But an idea that we have is to, to approximate, to take approximations of the Shapley value in order to be able to solve larger problems in terms of the number of features and the number of, of future values as well. Because with this, with this measure, I mean, how it is implemented, uh, computing the exact Shapley value, it would take a, a, a really long, long computational time. And yeah, so we are thinking about that. Okay. Uh, and that then, the dynamics. This is one shot, right? More or less. Uh, sorry, it's, the dynamics. You want to follow a patient. Let us keep to the 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 the, the, the paper. Uh, you want to follow a patient over time. It need not be that mortal disease like COVID nineteen, or it could be even. But they could be diseases which are less fatal and and still have to be minded. So my question would be, then these patients would undergo under different if they are classified correctly or incorrectly, undergo different treatments or different yeah treatments in the extended sense does not mean medical treatments by drugs treatments uh, receive different. Uh, services put it more neutral and then depending on the services of course they would enter a new class they would recover from as let's me talk talk about covid again over, uh, although it's a really tragic <laughs> thing suppose they recover from icu very yeah. rarely did unfortunately in, in 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 europe so they are sent back to the hospital and then they have a different status. And then the whole thing would start again. And they could even be, without knowing the history, it could even be that they would appear twice in your data. So how would you cope with this? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, actually a, a very interesting question and we didn't take into account the dynamics in this in this setup that's something that we didn't think about it uh, we had our data set and we just considered those who died and those who were admitted to the intensive care unit and 
maybe some people were in both uh, subsamples. Mm -hmm. So, but we studied them, let's say, independently. We didn't consider that they had been hospitalized prior to their admission in the intensive care unit. This is so, a typical this is a typical transition. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm not sure how to tackle that, but for yeah, but that's something we should think about because it, it would serve to alert the medical practitioners to 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 take the right decisions regarding the services destined for these patients and and yeah, the, the treatments graph, yes. that they should receive for sure. Yeah. The graph you showed us, for, for instance, about the ICU delivery of the oldest part of the patient groups, yeah. there could be several explanations. One explanation is that you provided already, it was too late. Yeah. But the second one could be decision of the doctor in case ICUs are overloaded because they say, yeah. okay, let's we treat change them. them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, the is the it thing... called in, in German. I don't know the, the English word for that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, it could be because it was too late for those patients, or as you mentioned, because. And you the... suffer a lot in ICUs. So, so yeah. they probably would have spared these poor people the last few days in, yeah. in pain and agony. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I completely agree. Actually, we, we, we thought it could be. Uh, what we what we mentioned that it could be a, a reason because of the drop, sure. uh, but uh, there there for sure there are uh, other other influ other other things that could influence that that would cause that drop for sure. So again, also to you, my respects for 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 taking up this very relevant real world problems the same is of course true to, of, of, of for Nina and, and Miriam all three problems are urgent to solve or to support and I appreciate very much the time and energy you spent to it and also the level of mathematical details is the only thing I can I can really is, uh, evaluate is 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 the sophistication of the models you used. It's. I know that it is demanding, but I, I'm like like Paul. I am very optimistic for the future. If if I am here, thank you very much, Manuel. That, that that's a lovely comment, and that we're all optimistic for the future. But I also like that comment that you're very impressed by the the mathematical description of the models, and this comes from some one of our editor in chiefs of one of our nice uh, journals. So that's something worth uh, just uh, paying attention to. Um, we have lots of people still here. Um, so I'd invite everybody to turn on your cameras and maybe if any of the uh, attendees have any um, comments or questions. I know we have some people attending who are expert in game theory as well. So if anybody there wants to, you can all turn on your camera, give a wave. We'll try and get a screenshot for our uh, PR as well. But if anybody there in the audience has any comments or, or questions. No, everybody happy. <laughs> All right. It's a lot, lot of detail. So well done to the, the speakers. That was a huge amount of detailed work to try and convey in a very short uh, little window. So we got the essence of, of your uh, projects. Um, and if we want the details, uh, we'll have to go and read the papers. Did I hear a voice there? Have we any? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry. I am not sure if my microphone is working, <laughs> but it Go seems ahead. to now. Yeah. Hi. Um. Yeah. I uh, needed to get to my laptop. I'm sorry. Um. I can't turn on my camera right now because I have an issue with it. <laughs> but I do have a question, um, for Laura about uh, the classification. Um. I found that topic very very interesting. Um especially with uh, relation to to finding out which pieces of, of data or which features um, have more influence on the observations that are made. Um, and I was wondering uh, if you know if there are other applications to this technique aside from, from classification, but just for um, picking up our data and deciding uh, what properties are more influential to the outcome. Thank you for... for 
for the comment. Um, well, regarding your question, uh, I I don't know about the specific applications of the influence measure, but actually we saw there was there were some some works as the ones I mentioned in my presentation that they use game theory to to assess the importance of futures on classification problems. And you can apply this to any to any data set that has uh, your categorical variables and your categorical response. Uh, the, the, the influence measure that I introduced can be used as, as a decision support tool to indicate you which are the most influential features, not to, to classify, but to say, well, this is your classification. This is the feature that most influenced on this specific classification for this uh, for this sample. So I believe that you could apply this methodology to other to other to other kind of problems regarding that you have a, a classification problem. I don't know if that answers your your question or not. Uh, it does. Thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Um, any questions or comments then from anybody else still there in our audience? We're all, all okay. So that was a lot, lot to take in. So well done again uh, to our speakers. We'll give them one final uh, round of applause there. So well done. Um, we are recording this and we will post it on our um, new YouTube channel. So I just want to share screen if I can one last time, if I can find my... Um, uh, slides. Here we go. <laughs> Apologies. So this is what I just wanted to, to let you all know about um, before we wrap up for today. Um, this was our first webinar of 2023. Uh, we do have 12 Young Women for a War uh, this year. So that was our first three speakers. And it's always hard to be uh, the first. So you set the standard and you've set the standard uh, very high. Um, our next webinar will be in early June. So uh, Dilek is one of our members there is going to um, be the facilitator for that one. Um, we have three speakers and um, three of our young women and the topic will be uh, location. Um, our following two webinars, we're still working on those. So the details of those ones to be finalized so probably September and November on the themes of uh, routing and scheduling. And then the last one, possibly around optimizing, optimizing for sustainability and fairness. Um, and then we are working on developing a, a winter webinar. It seems ages away, but December 2023. So keep an eye uh, uh, on our website. And um, this um, webinar is part of our events that we uh, run to um, make progress on our wisdom objectives. We're also trying to do some research. So we did publish a white paper and we have work in progress. So one paper in review and two other papers uh, in development. And um, so they're the themes of our papers. So the um, work in progress on co-authorship networks and also looking at the O or gender nexus. So Manuel mentioned very briefly about, you know, finding those connections with EDI objectives to see how we can use our O or tools uh, to make progress on those EDI agendas. Uh, so you'll see at the bottom of the slide there how you can keep in touch with us. So we're on the Euro website and uh, we have a LinkedIn group. Um, our young women have all mentioned that they're open to collaboration and connection. So possibly the best way to connect with them is on LinkedIn. Um, what else do I want to say? We have a YouTube channel. So thank you to our PR subcommittee. We now have a YouTube channel. So later on, the recording will pop up there. Um, Final thank yous for today. So Manuel, thank you for taking the time to uh, read and think about the topics that the young ladies uh, spoke about. Thank, um, I think you. getting the perspectives from somebody else who's fresh to your work is really insightful. So I think he really has opened some new uh, directions that you can think about and um, progressing your work. Um, Özgen is one of our, I want to say more thank you. So our three speakers as well, excellent work today. Thank you very much. All of our wisdom uh, subcommittee and especially our wisdom PR subcommittee um, and Özgen, if you want to wave your hand, Özgen there. Özgen has been working very, very hard with us the past while and will soon be stepping down. So a huge thank you to her for her contribution um, up until now. 
And that's about it, I think, from uh, me. Um, last uh, call out to everybody that's there. So I see some of our Wisdom Committee. Again, thank you to all of them for their great work and for keeping us all uh, going. Um, if we've no more comments or questions, we can just pause for ge some general chit chat. Or if we're all happy and we're all tired and zoomed out, <laughs> we can uh, say thank you very much for everybody. Um, we'll take one last screenshot. So anybody else that can turn on their camera, we will share some photos then on our social media. Okay, I think that's it then from, from our side. Unless anybody has anything they want to add, we'll all say thank you very much. Looking forward to seeing you at future events and well done to our young women. And thank you again to Manuel for his, his insightful commentary. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>